my Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. O Adonai, et dux domus Israel, qui moisi in igne flamme rubia paruisti, et ei in sina legem dedisti, veni ad redimendum nos in brachio extento. Lord Jesus Christ, we can never be grateful enough for this tremendous gift of the liturgy. As the philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand writes in his book, Liturgy and Personality, the liturgy is Christ praying. Therefore, Jesus, how awesome, how awe-filling it is to think about the fact that every time I participate in the liturgy, I am joining myself to you in prayer, so that together with you, we offer this prayer to God our Father in union with the Holy Spirit. At the risk of sounding pedantic, I began this time of prayer quoting something that perhaps sounds like some strange African dialect or language. But no, it was my attempt at Latin. And today happens to be the second day of the seven O antiphons. And the O is simply an interjection that we use to call the attention of the one we are addressing. And in this case, we are addressing you, O Lord, under your different names. And these antiphons are specifically found in the liturgy of the hours of these days, starting on the 17th and ending on the 23rd. And yesterday, Jesus, we referred to you as O Wisdom. The wisdom, as you went on to say, that comes from the mouth of the Most High. And in today's antiphon, as I began my prayer, I refer to you, Jesus, as the Adonai. And so the O Adonai, but it didn't stop there because I went on to refer to you as the leader of Israel. The translation of the whole Latin antiphon is as follows. O Adonai and leader of Israel, you appeared to Moses in a burning bush and you gave him the law on Sinai. O come and save us with your mighty power. Adonai in Hebrew means Lord, ruler, and is a name bestowed upon God in the Old Testament. And Jesus, I think about that word, Lord, and I think it is worth noting what the Catechism of the Catholic Church explains so well in paragraph 446. It says, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the ineffable Hebrew name, YHWH, Yahweh in short, by which God revealed himself to Moses, is rendered as Kyrios, that is, Lord. From then on, Lord becomes the more usual name by which to indicate the divinity of Israel's God. The New Testament uses this full sense of the title Lord for both the Father and, what is new, for Jesus, who is thereby recognized as God himself. And so Jesus I cry out to you, we cry out to you, saying, O come and save us with your mighty power. And the amazing thing is that you respond to our prayer. And this is what we are preparing for as we are getting closer and closer to Christmas. It is also what we read about in today's Gospel, taken from the first chapter of the first Gospel. We read the following. This is how Jesus Christ came to be born. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they came to live together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Other translations have, in place of betrothed, espoused to Joseph. One of the ways we use to make reference to our Blessed Mother Mary is to call her the Blessed Virgin Mary, and as well as the Blessed Mother, that is, the mother of God, your mother Jesus, and my mother too. So she is both virgin and mother. Virgin and mother make reference to two of the four dogmas of Mary. 
with regard to her being a virgin, the fathers of the church note that she was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the same time, she is the Theotokos, Greek for the mother of God, as was solemnly declared in the Council of Ephesus. On the 7th of December, we celebrated the feast of St. Ambrose, one of the great Western Church Fathers, a bishop, a doctor of the Church, as well as a great rhetorician. He wrote so eloquently and spoke so well that God used him to reach St. Augustine's heart while he was on his path back to the Church. Once he discovered his vocation in apostolic celibacy as the Bishop of Milan, he led an exemplary life of heroic virtue. St. Ambrose wrote so well on virginity that it is said that mothers will hide their daughters from listening to him because so many will end up giving their lives completely to Jesus as virgins. One of his amazing books is his book on virginity in which he uses the Song of Songs to speak about this great vocation. And Jesus, I thought that in this time of prayer, you could speak to my heart through your word, and so well illumined and eloquently explained by this great saint. And these words will be of great benefit to men and women who have given themselves or who are thinking of giving themselves in apostolic celibacy or virginity. He says, you are one of God's people, of God's family, a virgin among virgins. You light up your grace of booty with your splendor of soul. More than others, you can be compared to the church. When you are in your room, then at night, think always on Christ and wait for his coming at every moment. And let me pause here for a moment, Lord, and tell you that I desire this more and more every day as I prepare to receive you as I try and live out this holy season of Advent. Then St. Ambrose says, This is the person Christ has loved in loving you, the person he has chosen in choosing you. He enters by the open door. He has promised to come in, and he cannot deceive. Embrace him, the one you have sought. Turn to him, and be enlightened. Hold him fast. Ask him not to go in haste. Beg him not to leave you. The word of God moves swiftly. He is not worn by the lukewarm, nor held fast by the negligent. Let your soul be attentive to his word. Follow carefully the path God tells you to take, for he is swift and is passing. And again, here, Jesus, I like to pause and ask you not to pass me by. And with your grace, help me react. Help me hate lukewarmness. St. Ambrose then goes on to say, What does his bride say? I sought him and did not find him. I called him and he did not hear me. Do not imagine that you are displeasing to him despite having called him. Ask him in and open the door to him. And that this is the reason why he has gone so quickly? No, for he allows us to be constantly tested. When the crowds pressed him to stay, what does he say in the gospel? I must preach the word of God to other cities because for that I have been sent. But even if it seems to you that he has left you, go out and seek him once more. And here again, Lord, I'd like to pause and just ask you to help me. Never give up in seeking you out. And how do I seek you out? And how do I hold on to you once I have found you? Again, St. Ambrose here provides a solution. He says, Who but Holy Church is to teach you how to hold Christ fast? Indeed, she has already taught you, if you only understood her words in scripture, how short a time it was when I left them before I found him whom my soul has loved. I held him fast, and I would not let him go. How do we hold him fast? Not by restraining chains or knotted ropes, but by bonds of love, by spiritual reins, by the longing of the soul. And now I turn to you, Mary Ever-Virgin asking you to intercede for those who are thinking of giving themselves or have already given themselves completely to your son, just like you did.
I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into practice. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.